Um, okay, uh, imagine that you are um, opening a textbook in anthropology. And textbooks tend to have these kind of grandiose claims that this is the comparative study of humankind. This is to finesse our understanding of what it is to be human. And then you pick up a study with the discipline. And it's a bit more likely to be kind of mobile phones in Patagonia, the cattle on their sort of symbolism amongst the so-and-so. It's a discipline that is ambitious in intent, but maybe a, a tad parochial um, in practice. Now, beginning of the year, I got a really large grant. Um, and this grant is great because it's enabled me to assemble a fabulous team of postdocs and uh, PhD students, and the intention is that we're going out to conduct ethnographies in seven different countries, full-length ethnographies, looking at the impact of these um, new social media. Um, it means for five years, I have no teaching, I have no admin, I am not unhappy. Um, but I did feel that given that, if ever in your career you should have a go at that big textbook question and transcend the parochialism, inevitable parochialism of studies, then maybe this would be the time to do it. But how the hell do you go about finessing our understanding of what it is to be human? Or in the context of this conference, how do we think this relationship between technology and being human? Now my inspiration for this is going to be somebody who isn't an anthropologist, Though he did write a book called An Anthropologist for Mars, and books like uh, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Um, Oliver Sacks, I think, is a pretty well-known author. I hope many of you have read his work. Now, if you look at his books, you find there's a kind of pattern in each chapter. We start off with this extraordinary person in terms of their individuality, replete with all the things we would expect of, 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 of an individual. But then something tragic happens, a birth defect, illness, whatever, and suddenly they lose all sorts of capacities. And the curious thing about it is it's things that we think of as quintessentially human, like emotion or empathy or mood that seem to be turned on or turned off by something that has actually happened to our technology, to something like the nervous system. And we realise that there is this potential, if you like, technological reductionism that is usually cruel and tragic in terms of what it does to us. But then what Sachs does is he moves from there, and in the latter part of these chapters, he builds us back and he shows that, yes, but actually those things that we um, care about are not just coming out from that technology. There's also these other elements that build in it. He talks about the soul and the sacred and beauty. And at the end of the chapter, you have an awe of what it is to be human, but one that in this case manages to acknowledge that actual fundamental dependency that normally we would not actually think about at all. Okay. So that's the way kind of Sachs does it, but the reason, in a sense, it's relatively straightforward is that these technologies are biological. They are, of course, inherently part of being human. But we are interested here in technologies that are external to the body and their relationship to us. And there, if you look at the literature, it tends to be rather different. Um, in the whole, there's a lot of images around kind of Frankenstein and science fiction. And although it's not always dualistic, when you listen to these terms of post-human and transhuman and cyborg and whatever, there is clearly a tendency in that direction. Um, it's much more difficult to kind of accept these things. But that is a problem because an anthropologist is not a physician. We see the substance of being human in terms of people's social relations, their kinship, um, and certainly integral to that would be communication. So how are we going to bring these external technologies, and not only that, technologies that change over time, and make this analogous to these internal technologies that are basically um, given? Now, one possible bridge here, um, there's a book that has just come out, um, it's edited by Heather Horst and myself, it's called Digital Anthropology, and in one of the chapters in that book, Faye Ginsberg, an anthropologist,
talks about disability and digital forms. And she gives an example where people who do suffer from autism, etc., um, have not previously been able to communicate in what we would regard as a normal way to other people. And they say that as a result, they tend to be regarded as something less than human. But once they start communicating through online and appear to other people just the same as everybody else, they feel for the first time they are being regarded as fully human. So here is a case where we see um, the use of a new media, a capacity to actually build up and make somebody who wasn't previously necessarily seen as human here being so seen. And what the stance I'm trying to lead to is opposed to, I would say, is the kind of ethos that you get in, say, Cheryl Turkle's new book, Alone Together, but it's also a very popular, and I would say a very conservative stance, that seems to suggest that whatever new media is developing at any given time, it is somehow a loss from, or detracts from, what we regard as human, which is the previous thing that we were up to that time. And obviously it references again this discourse about authenticity that we just heard about um, in the keynote. Now, um, the, the problem with that, I think, is that it seems to imagine that if you had sort of, I don't know, um, two pre-colonial Australian Aboriginals talking in the desert, right, one together, that is the sort of, like, authentic, proper sociality of being human. That's the natural sort of communication, and is not, therefore, a mediator form. And all these other things that come since, they impose mediation upon that given relationship. Now, I would argue that's pretty much the exact opposite of what anthropologists tend to think. Anthropologists would argue, I think that everybody is, if you like, equally cultural, and in that sense, equally mediated. Those Australian individuals worked with kinship systems, symbolic systems, that were probably very prescriptive about who could say exactly what to whom. If you're talking through a smartphone, you may be differently mediated, but I would argue you are not more mediated. And indeed, in the introduction to this book, Digital Anthropology, we make sort of six principles. And one of the principles is we argue that to be successful, what a digital anthropology should do is actually show how, through the study of these new forms, they reveal how the previous forms of communication were actually mediated in really interesting ways that we didn't previously appreciate, but now we do. It fails to the degree that it simply puts this out there as some new form of mediation, and therefore a loss from some simpler or more authentic notion of humanity. But for that, we need a different idea of humanity. Now at the moment, I'm in the middle of writing um, a book with uh, Virginia Zinnerman, which is a study of the use of webcam. Um, it's part, and I'm going to be Skype. Um, it's partly based on fieldwork in Trinidad and, and some other work besides. And as we're writing the conclusion, um, we're developing what we're calling, at least at the moment, um, a theory of attainment. And let me uh, explain this through example. The first chapter of this book is not, as you would expect, um, a discussion of how people at one end of the webcam see the person at the other end. Um, it's actually about the fact that we notice that when people are using Skype, um, they often find that they are drawn to a little box in the corner in which they see themselves. Um, and there's something rather interesting about that. Because, of course, previously, we've always had photos, we have mirrors, we can see ourselves in that sense. But actually, when you are looking at that <coughs> box, there's something different. What you are seeing is the way you are in ordinary conversational mode, because after half an hour of chatting on Skype, you relax into the gestural forms, etc., that you would otherwise have. Um, and the point is that actually, up until then, that has never been possible. Um, we've always, what, you want to know what you look like to the other person talking to you, um, but you've never actually seen it in that way. This time, you can actually follow yourself, engage in this kind of conversation. Certainly increases self-consciousness. Um, but the point I would make is this. Would you define being human as a state of frustration 
because actually you would quite like to be able to see yourself in that way, but for technological reasons you weren't able to do it. Isn't that a slightly odd way of understanding what it is to be human? Um, why not instead have a concept which includes a sense of latency in what we are, that allows us to understand the impact of these developments without it being a growth or subtraction of being human, but in a different way as actually part and parcel of what we mean by that term, which is why we're calling this a theory of attainment. And the other chapters in this book argue similar uh, notions with respect to other issues, such as intimacy, etc. In fact, I was reminded a bit about the idea when I was listening to Larissa this morning talking about that Korean who feels that, you know, the problem with the Australian internet is not fast enough to be seamless, which means not fast enough to be society as now, he feels it just kind of is and should be. Um, so, there is a concept there of attainment. Now, we're exploring this through this book, but I was also thinking, can this be brought forward into the new project um, that the whole team, as it were, are looking at over the next several years? And as part of this project, um, I was down in the grant to particularly do the ethnography in the UK. And when I was thinking about my particular ethnographic site, um, I decided, to the surprise of many, that although it's a study of new of social uh, networking sites, new social media, that I actually based my work in a hospice. And since May, I've been doing field work, and most of the people I'm, I'm working with are people who are diagnosed with terminal cancer, in fact, they've all been cancer um, up, up to now. Now, why would you make that choice? Why would you do that? Um, three reasons, really. One, to be honest, it was a hell of a lot of money, and I kind of felt um, one should perhaps try and do something of direct welfare import, and the director of the hospice is trying to think about their policy um, and how they might sort of facilitate um, their relationship to patients through the use of new media, so there hopefully will be a direct policy outcome of this. Um, that's number one. Number two, um, was something that really came out of the work I've been previously published in, in Tales of Facebook. And what I sort of felt from that work was that at the moment we tend to think of things like social network sites in particularly associated with the young because the young are the main users and it was effectively invented um, for their use. But something that came out from that work was actually, um, although that is true now, if we want to think about social network sites in the long term, um, Maybe, actually, there is a very different group for whom I think in the long term it's going to be much more important. And I would argue it is the elderly. Um, and that the youth will move on and do what they do, but I see a long-term relationship with the elderly. And the reason for that, which came out through the fieldwork, is that for people who are, for one reason or another, losing mobility, it's more difficult for them to be directly co-present with other people, but who are desperately concerned to actually keep up with all their friends, relatives, the news and all the rest of it, then social network sites fit particularly well. Um, it's a similar argument actually that uh, Mirka Madiano and myself were making in this uh, book on migration in new media, where again we argue that the vanguard and development of what we call polymedia tends to be with these Filipino mothers um, who have their children left behind in the Philippines, not again because they're skilled, they're not particularly skilled, but again, it's a logical necessity that will, I think, find its place sooner or later. Um, so that's kind of the second reason. The third reason for working in the hospice, though, comes back to the starting point today. That basically, I'm trying to think how to follow through these arguments of people like Oliver Sacks and try and understand what it is to be human in a way that sees a closer analogy or integration between, if you like, these internal um, technologies and the external technologies that we're about. And the hospice is a good context for this, partly because their own ethos is very much about, um, a positive ethos about creating worlds. What, the point about a hospice is a hospice is not trying to cure anybody. The people related to a hospice have acknowledged that they are going to die. So what the hospice can do is actually say, how can we enhance the rest of your life? How can we let the better? This is a hospice that specializes in things like very, very late marriages, or um, finally having that exhibition of your water companies that has never happened up to now. And partly with that kind of ethos, we're trying to say, well, okay, let us explore this particular moment as a part of life, 
and see if it is a privileged position for understanding this wider question of what we mean by human. So to give a few examples of the kind of material that is coming up from this in its early days, um, Cowell. Cowell is somebody who is one of the informants who, who um, did use Facebook. And she hadn't previously, and in fact, the day she was diagnosed as terminal was the day that her son um, opened up a Facebook account for her, which she'd never encountered before. But pretty quickly, she took to it, and she used it effectively as a blog, and she started to talk about and share her experience. Because since she was in the medical profession, she felt that it was important people avoid having a relationship to death and dying. And she felt actually it is important to give people some sense of this experience and for them to learn from it. And the people in turn, grew in numbers, were actually able to um, respond and to appreciate and to say how much they were learning from this. Um, and this included the suffering, the, the tubes down the throat and the kinds of pain one suffers from, but it also included you know, the doctor saying she shouldn't take a holiday to Spain, but she did and all the photos, etc., that come with that. And I remember talking to her um, garden under a, with a glass of Prosecco, and she was clear that Facebook had completely transformed this experience of dying from something that was uh, completely, as it were, negative, to at least the way she'd be able to share it. Because even members of her family who had been quoting before were sort of reconciled because of their interactions on this slide. And ten days later, she died, but after having that kind of experience. Another very different example, um, a 90-year-old I'm working with, um, who has just got her iPad, uh, two or three weeks before I met her, as excited as any giddy teenager. She's always got a thousand photos on it. And she feels that, you know, um, the problem is, she's 90, her hands shake. And she realised she had a little wooden stand um, that she used to put her recipe books on. And so she's taken the wooden stand, and instead she puts her iPad on it, so it's not shaking, so she can now webcam with all her relatives and testimony and all the rest of it. Positive. Also, lots of negative. There are plenty of people I work with who would probably say that one of the few saving graces of dying at this point is that nobody is going to force them to engage with all these horrible new technologies <laughs> that they really don't have any to do. But worse than that, I think, is the sense that people have of exclusion. Exclusion which means that the feeling that you are not enabled to engage with these forms of technology, these external technologies, if anything exacerbates the feelings that one is having at such a period, that one is being disengaged even from the biological, as it were, natural capacities that one previously had in relation to communication. But the point is, whether it is the positives or the negatives, in both cases you can see how people in their own experiences are drawing together these different forms of communication technology and understanding them as integral um, to what it means um, to be a person. So, to conclude. Um, the argument is that maybe we could rethink something rather fundamental in the topic here, which is this relationship between technology and hum being human. Um, the ideal of this theory of attainment is to take us some way along that route so that we could integrate a latency in humanity with a mobility in the development of new communications. Um, the new projects around the hospice um, this will be three years field work, as far as I'm concerned, um, it's very, very early days. Um, but maybe, just maybe, it is something that could contribute to that textbook promise, that we might be able to finesse our understanding of what it is to be human.